Good evening. Welcome to today's BTSYM lecture, organised jointly with TAC Young Members and IC London Graduate Students Committee. I'm Divik and I'm the sub-chair of professional development for BTSYM. You might be already quite aware of uh, what BTSYM does, uh, but just to give you a reminder, we provide a forum for professional development, but also social interaction for people interested within tunneling and working within the underground spaces industry here in the UK. You can follow us on almost all major social media platforms, uh, the links to which are provided on the left hand side of your screens, but also you can scan the barcode to, to get access uh, to our various social media handles. Just a quick update in terms of where we are uh, this year. So the BTSYM has finally announced the incoming committee for committee year 2020-21. At the same time, we've released our applications now. So if you're dialing in from the UK and you want to get involved with the various subcommittees that form the bigger BTSYM committee, please uh, scan the barcode on your screen or visit our link tree uh, page and you'll find the details to the application there. The deadline for the application is 12th of October. The second, our second partner in today's lecture is IC London Graduate Students Committee, who are basically similar to the BTSYM, but they cover civil engineering, uh, civil engineers across all disciplines equally. They're formed of not only graduate but student members, but also technicians and apprentices. Very much like BTSYM, they support the professional development of non chartered members of the institution, helping them to proceed towards that chartership. Uh, they provide a forum for thought exchange for the next generation of industry leaders and they also lead IC London STEM outreach. You can find further information about the GNS and their activities on the ICE website uh, or you can contact uh, the Honorary Secretary at the email address provided on the screen right now and of course reach them through various social media platforms. Uh, the ICGNS meets once a month and their meetings takes, uh, take place on the first Tuesday of the month. They are online right now, uh, but if you need any further information, please uh, drop a line uh, to the Honorary Secretary. And on that note, I'll hand over to Caitlin, who will give you a quick introduction of uh, TACYM and introduce today's speaker. So over to you, Caitlin. Thank you, Divik. So hello, everyone. I'm Caitlin, and I'm here to introduce the Tunneling Association of Canada's Young Members Group. So TACYM was developed in 2014, and its goal is to provide a platform of communication between students, young professionals, and mentors within the industry, and also connect students with different uh, tunneling societies like the British Tunneling Society and the Greek Tunneling Society, for example. TACYM creates learning opportunities for um, members to participate and uh, organize different technical talks. Um, there's also a young members webinar series, which was running um, over the course of the summer uh, online due to COVID. And in the past, we've also organized field trips and site visits. So for example, the, the Kingston group has gone out to visit the Brockville tunnel in past years. And there's also the opportunity to engage in conferences and workshops. So TACYM also encourages students to um, apply for a TAC undergraduate scholarship and graduate scholarship, which are great opportunities within the group. And we have three active TACYM groups in Canada. So there are two in the eastern side of Canada, the Toronto and Kingston groups, and one on the west coast, the Vancouver group. And we also have our um, contact information and social media information listed on the left hand side of the slide. So we're on Facebook, Instagram, the Tunneling Association is also on LinkedIn and you can contact us if you have questions by email or look for additional information on the web. 
So thank you very much. Um, and now I'm going to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Mark Knight. So Dr. Mark Knight is a professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Waterloo, where he teaches geotechnical and trenchless construction courses. For the last 20 years, he's also been the executive director for the Center for Advancement of Trenchless Technologies, also located at the University of Waterloo. Mark has a BSc in Geological Engineering and an MSc in Civil Engineering from the University of New Brunswick and a PhD in Civil Engineering from Queen's University. Prior to starting his PhD, Mark worked as a consulting geotechnical engineer on a wide variety of projects. And over the last 20 years, Mark's research has focused primarily in the area of trenchless construction and water infrastructure asset management. Mark has also been retained as a technical expert and designer for numerous challenging trenchless construction projects and as a litigation expert for projects where significant cost issues have occurred, often relating to changing ground conditions. Mark has also developed several industry leading trenchless design programs and currently chairs several American Waterworks Association committees, the Manual of Water Main Rehabilitation Revision, Water Main Rehabilitation and the Cured in Place Pipe Standard. Mark is also a former member of the CGS SOS Executive Committee. So now I would like to pass on to Mark for the presentation today. Thank you so much, Mark. Well, thank you very much, Caitlin. Um, so I'm going to this presentation was originally developed for the uh, Canadian Geotechnical Society um, and is based on some of my experience as a litigator and some information that uh, I have learned over the last 10 plus years around the need for improved uh, trenchless app or in geotechnical investigations for trenchless projects. What I want to do is make you aware of some of the uh, industry trends and how we can improve them in the industry. Um, I'm also hopefully going to show you that we need to do more and better geotechnical reports and investigation um, specifically for trenchless related projects. And then I want to show you uh, 10 lessons learned that I have learned um, by being a expert um, in some litigation cases and, I, and, um, and hopefully uh, show you how you can reduce your potential for litigation. Um, the most common method for installing pipelines over the last 50 to 100 plus years has been open cut construction, which I call open heart surgery. Um, and therefore we dig a hole, we insert a pipe and we place backfill materials in the stuff around. So we've got lots of operators in the stuff, um, nothing new on that side. Um, over the last 20 plus years, we've developed uh, trenchless pipeline construction methods. Um, so we are gonna um, have an excavation at possibly at both ends of the pipeline. Um, and we're going to install or build a new pipeline using two methods, horizontal directional drilling or microtunneling have been uh, common. Um, these are much more environmentally friendly to open cut um, uh, for, and can also come in at reduced cost. Um, an interesting note, uh, this uh, summer Metro Vancouver has become carbon neutral. And one of the ways that they have uh, became carbon neutral was the adopting of trenchless construction methods for their pipeline construction. Just to give you an idea of the trenchless industry in Canada, it's a multi-billion dollar industry annually. Um, in the city of Toronto area, we have more microtunneling projects going on than anywhere in North America, and each of those projects are over um, are typically multi-million dollar projects. Uh, many of these projects are complex projects with curved tunnels, um, and so we've we've come a long ways. Uh, 15 years ago, we did no microtunneling projects at all. Um, that's going to continue on uh, for the next uh, 20 to 30 years, at the at at the same rate or if not more. Um, we've also got a great uh, knowledgeable contractor base, especially for horizontal directional drilling and microtunneling. And we've developed uh, many good practices and industry standards, and, and I encourage you to make sure that you understand uh, what the, these industry best practices and standards are, especially if you're going to be a designer or being involved in a trenchless related project. Uh, one of the barriers for the adoption of trenchless projects has really been poor designs and the poor understanding of the trenchless construction method, especially by the engineering community and the consulting side. 
I'm just going to give you a quote out of um, Underground Construction Technology Annual Survey. Um, this is by a contractor, and it says, our jobs are hard enough without engineers expecting us to give them on-job training about what they should look for on a drill. Um, believe it or not, uh, it's a sad state that uh, contractors know more than often the consulting engineers that are involved in the project. And I'm going to give you some case studies a little bit later on that will demonstrate this point a little bit. Our transless projects are very different than the, than the traditional open cut, and we have to be able to do these things differently. We have to understand the complexity of these projects and not underestimate the complexity of them. Um, for any type of project, we should always do a site investigation, and the objective of any site investigation, whether it's an open cut or trenchless or tunneling project, is we need su sufficient information to enable a safe and economical design to be made. We also want that information so that on the design side, we can avoid uh, co construction difficulties on the upfront side, so before the contractor. Anytime the contractor gets involved in a construction delay or construction issue, if it was avoidable, there's going to be high cost associated and, um, and extra payments that are probably going to be looked after or, or maintained. For directional drilling and tunneling projects, we got to find the we have to specify the right equipment. We have to have the right drill fluids, um, and there's many reasons that we need that. We want to have a successful project that's a win for the owner, win for the consultants, and win for the contractor. But we also have to develop realistic cost estimates. So if I'm planning a project and being the designer of the project, I have to do what's called the engineer's estimate. Um, I'll make sure that the owner has enough money for, in order to be able to bid the project. Um, it doesn't look very good if I estimate the project at $1 million and all the bids are going to come back at uh, $5 million. The second part of any cost estimate is really the cost estimate of the bidders that are going to do it. So we typically take a project, put it out to bid, and uh, we're going to get bid prices back. And, and we need to have... Um, this information for them to be able to do that. And I'm going to go a little bit more detail why bid prices really need good geotechnical information. We need to know the sequence, the thickness, the lateral extent of soil strata and where the level of bedrock is. We're going to contain samples of soil and rock, identify, classify, and get all those relevant soil and rock parameters. We need to know where the groundwater table is. And then when, if we're down into soil or rock, we need to be able to do uh, soil and rock classification or some testing, in situ testing, to be able to get real parameters. Um, not that long ago, several years ago, I was at a workshop and we were talking about geotechnical needs. And, and um, one of the persons in the discussion in the industry said uh, we need to do advanced geotechnical testing. And I asked what advanced geotechnical testing was, and that was triaxial and unconfined compressive strengths. And I think we've come backwards in not doing um, the same level of work that we used to do in the 1960s and, and 70s and 80s. I'm just going to give a, a basic graphic. If we, The more geotechnical information that we end up doing, the more boreholes I've got on the bottom axis. Make sure I'm a laser pointer. So on the bottom axis is my costs to do a geotechnical investigation or in, in the investigation or testing. The more boreholes I do, it's basically a linear line. If I look at the total cost of construction, if I don't have any boreholes, it's extremely high, and that, number, that will come down and level off. The more boreholes that I eventually get, I get a better understanding of the site conditions. And once I know the site conditions, more boreholes is not going to do anymore. So that's going to um, give this line's going to basically flatten off on, on that cost. I can add these to site investigation and, and get my total project cost by total. And um, in an ideal world, this is a minimum project cost. This is how much site investigation that I should be able to do. So. Most geotechnical books and lectures will have this type of bathtub type curve, um, but in real life, it's almost impossible to be able to know uh, where that bathtub is with respect to project costs and bids. Um, one interesting thing to note is that if we don't do any geotechnical information is that we're going to get an extremely high cost. The more information, it's going to start to decrease, and the reason that is is really contractor risk tell the contractor nothing about the site conditions, they're gonna give a much higher price, 
we start to get information on that, um, prices should come down and stabilize. And let's take, so we need to be able to do that. Um, high cost, limited or no geotech, we're gonna have high contractor risk, therefore high bid. Uh, we also have the uh, opportunity for changing ground conditions, unit rates, extra cost. Um, the other one that if there is a problem on site with respect to bidding, then we get lawyers involved um, no one wins except for lawyers. Um, a typical cost of a geotechnical engineer is somewhere between $100 to $200 per hour in Canada. Um, when I used to be a consultant and practicing, these numbers really haven't changed that much. Um, if you look, take your car in to get it serviced when they have no liability and risk, um, it's $80 to over $100 per hour. And if we're looking at lawyers, um, you're looking somewhere between $400 and $750 per hour. And again, lawyers have basically no risk. They're going to charge you by the hour. So it's very expensive to get lawyers involved in projects and things tend to stall. Our best guess thing to do is to keep the lawyers out of our out of our business. Um, this is some work that we've been doing um, with the region or the city of Niagara Falls. And these are bid projects um, for pipeline construction from basically uh, 2007 to 2014. So these are all the projects and the stuff they put out. So we've got uh, on the bottom end is the low bid and the top end is the high bid. And this was the award bid, whoever won the bid on, on this project. So what we're going to call the spread be the, between the low bid and the high bid is really an indication of the amount of risk that the contractors um, are, are subjected to with respect to the price. Um, projects down here that have a very close low bid to high bid means that there's very little risk. So again, we really want, if we're putting out projects with low risk, the contractors are going to bid. We'd expect these type of clustering on projects. Um, these are much higher risk projects between the low bid and the high bid and number of projects and the stuff. So that, so a good tender specification and good site investigation information will really help us lower this spread between between bid prices and the stuff on that side. So again, we can track risk by tracking uh, prices on tender prices and get an estimate of where your risk is being spent. Um, in 1994, the U.S. National Committee on Tunneling Technologies produced a report um, that's quite interesting. Um, on the bottom axis, uh, what, on the x-axis is the boreholes and linear linear feet per root of tunnel alignment. So we're going to do more boreholes as we keep on going out this way. Um, on the y-axis, in this case, is the change requested. So there's two um, on this one. And this one, zero, the open dots are basically the engineer's estimate, and the solid one are the contractor's estimate. And in between this project here, you see there's quite a gap between the engineer's estimates, quite a bit lower um, than the uh, than the contractor's estimate. Um, so again, that's not a very good pricing between between these two, and we've got a change request of 80% of the total production cost. So um, these are cost overruns um, on these projects. Um, this study looked at 84 projects, including 10 Canadian projects at the time. If you do uh, an overall mean, you get, end up around 0.34 boreholes per linear foot. Uh, 0.42 is common. Um, we can do an upper bound and we can do a lower bound on this information. And you start to, again start to see this impact of risk. Um, no geotechnical information down here, which is very little boreholes. I can go from anywhere from zero to up to say 70% cost overruns and, and changes in, in, in my project costs. And as I do more geotechnical inf information and boreholes, I'm eliminating that risk. And you can start to see that after I get around a borehole ratio of 1.15, uh, my cost, now I'm into my contingency level somewhere between 10 to 20% of, of the change requests uh, that were basically made. So we can make huge cost savings by providing good geotechnical information. So again, uh, much more similar to the bathtub curve that I showed you before, but now we have a little bit more um, qual quantitative data in order to be able to substantiate doing more benefit. So again, borehole tunnel ratio greater than not that much benefit with respect to it. Um, they also reproduce this one is contractors bid as as a percent of completed costs. So now they've got a completed cost. So 
at 100 percent that means my bid cost and my project total crop project cost were exactly the same so anything below this line is money that the contractor is basically putting in their pocket Again, if we do no boreholes, um, the contractors are can be putting away uh, seven. You know, their actual cost is seventy percent, so you've left thirty percent on the table. Um, contractors are never going to complain if they make too much money on the bid process, so they're going to be walking away with this money in their pocket. Um, the issue happens is if we get above this line, and now we've got a cost here of. Uh, What's that? Over 170 percent of the, or 70 percent of the actual project cost. So a million dollar project is now 1.7 million dollar project. You can start to see the more more boreholes that we've got, uh, the less chance that there's going to be a contractor that is going to off uh, have an extra an extra cost associated with it. Um, these extra costs, if the contractor has extra costs associated that was not part of their bid project, this is where litigation starts to happen. So, again, if they can't uh, regenerate their money, they're going to go after it in a legal in a legal way, especially if there's lots of money on the table. So, was, I think this graph is is great, showing that uh, the more inf information the contractor has about the subsurface geotechnical uh, conditions the more informed and competitive their bids will be. So again, out here, um, 1.15, you can start to see everything is in a pretty tight band and, and, and that thing. So again, um, this is good information to sell the need. And I think young engineers and older engineers in Canada, North America, we really need to, to, to go out and sell the value proposition of doing uh, good geotechnical programs on the upfront side. All right, so the next thing I want to talk about is the engineer of record. Um, it's a term that we don't have in Ontario in our definition in, uh, in, our, uh, in our Professional Engineering Act. I know that it is the definition in uh, BC, um, and I imagine in, in the UK there's also a definition of the engineer of record. So the engineer of record is responsible to ascertain the final design, including any changes made during construction, and make sure that this design meets applicable standards, designs, and guidelines, and is not re but is not responsible for coming up with the design for the contractor and the stuff to do. And in the field, you may have another engineering firm that's looking after the quality construction, but that information has to feed back to the engineer of record. So in the next couple of slides, I want to highlight where the engineer of record is um, as part of the construction project. I think it's important for anybody being involved in any project, especially when you get involved in litigation, is understand where you fit and your role and who's who are the key people in in the role? Um, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is a typical designer contractor build project. So the owner defines some project scope and definition. What is it they want to build? Is it a gravity sewer at a certain online non grade? Is it um, a trunk sewer? Or maybe it's a railway tunnel. Whatever it is, they're going to have to define what the scope and the project is and the stuff on the side. They're going to typically hire a consulting engineering firm. That firm is going to do some preliminary designs. They're going to select a route and the pipe materials and the construction method. They're going to do some preliminary cost estimates and the feasibility of the construction and get approval from the owner um, to be able to get the go-ahead. Once they've got approval for basic costs, then you come out and you do some site investigation. Um, really what you're trying to do is get fill your data gaps and get information to be able to confirm and improve your preliminary designs. We're looking for surface obstruction or conditions, obstacles such as buried utilities and other things and any other site constraints on that way. And then we're going to produce a final design with the route, the pipe and a cost estimate. And that's going to go out to project tender. So you're also going to prepare the uh, tender documents and then you're going to collect the bids and award um, or make the recommendation for award to the contractor, uh, to the owner, sorry. Which contractor do you recommend that the owner hire for this project at a given price? Once the project is, uh, well, contractor is awarded, um, then you got to make sure that quality assurance and quality control, that things are done right and uh, your design objectives are met in the field. 
And then you've got contract uh, administration, which is project management, making sure that the contractor gets paid at the right period of time and deliverables. So in this type of project, the one that's doing the design or the engineer of record is really the engineer at this stage that's preparing and designing this project. Um, they're the ones that are putting their stamp on the engineering drawings and doing their report. They're the one that's ultimately responsible for this design. This design must be constructible. Um, many designs that I see in, in projects that I get involved in, uh, engineers are putting out designs that are not actually constructible. Uh, contractors will bid them. Um, contractors have told me if I only bid work that was constructible, I wouldn't have any jobs. So they're going to bid the jobs knowing that they're going to have to get it changed um, and make to make it actually constructible and workable. So this is one um, typically common model um, in here. The other type of model that can be done is much more of on a contractor design build type project. Again, we're going to define the scope of work. They're still going to hire a consultant. They're still going to do preliminary designs, route the pipe, cost estimates, and feasibility. Um, they're still going to go through the same process, get approval from the owner, do site investigation. We're going to get surface conditions, obstacles, and site constraints. Um, and the reason we're going to make all this information available, and then we're going to take all this information and give it to um, potential contractors and we're going to request for proposals in here. So the contractors now is going to do the design. They're going to hire an engineer um, and um, they're going to stamp the engineering drawings. When I've done these types of projects, I'm going to request as part of the proposal that everything is stamped by a professional engineer in the design and they're going to do a contractor design build type project. So now what we're doing, we're moving the risk from construction back to the uh, contractor. The contractor is actually getting paid here uh, to actually do the design on this side. However, there's a lot of information that has to be done on the upfront side up here by the owner's engineer because the contractor just can't get out there and do the actual site investigation. And, and do you, you have to know what type of techniques and the stuff that are involved in. So again, we're moving the risk and getting the contractor to pay in between. Often in many projects that I see, um, the owners are not really doing the design. They're putting out a design, but they want the contractors to do it. However, they're still using this old um, designer contractor build model. There's advantage of different types of both things. So what I'm going to say is if you're stamping a report or a design, ask yourself, can I defend under cross-examination by a lawyer in court? Am I a trained professional? and an experienced professional in order to be able to do that design that I've, uh, that I've done. What training experience do you have? And if you can't answer yes that you have or defend yourself in court, um, then um, what I would suggest is that you do not do the project or you hire an expert that can help you do this type of project so that uh, there is no issues in the stuff later on. So um, on that side. Um, the term negligence is um, is a is an issue that can happen around engineering practice. Um, and under the uh, Professional Engineering Act, Reg uh, 941 in Ontario, um, this act has a definition for professional misconduct. Professional misconduct. There's a definition for neg means negligence. If we look at negligence um, as a means, it says uh, negligence means the act or omission in carrying out the work of a practitioner that constitutes a failure to maintain the standards that is reasonable or prudent, a prudent practitioner would maintain in the circumstances. So what does this really mean? It means that you have to be an expert and defend yourself as an expert, as a professional engineer before you're doing actually any design. Under section eight, H of that of this section, it says undertaking work that the practitioner is not competent to perform by the virtue of the practitioner's training and experience. Um, there are doctors, and if you're a foot doctor, I don't think anybody would expect a foot doctor to perform brain surgery. Um, also, I wouldn't expect that all engineers and civil engineers are experts in, in a variety of different construction. If you're uh, an expert at, at designing and building bridges, um, you're not going to be an expert at doing trenchless projects. So you have to be able to get that expertise in the stuff in order to be able to do it. So again, 
uh, we got to make sure that we perform our engineering practices within the limits and the scope um, that would that that we do have and our knowledge base. Um, why do um, one thing that I often see in many geotechnical reports in southern Ontario that I end up reviewing is they make uh, recommendations in this report for um, trenchless construction. Um, I, it baffles me. Um, I want to know as the they're not the engineer of record, they're not the designers. Um, they are often not privy to all the information with respect to how um, the construction methodology or a variety of other site information is. Um, so if anything, I would caveat that any recommendations are, are relatively guidelines. If I am the engineer of record for a design of a trenchless type project, um, one thing that I'll always do is get the geotechnical engineers to remove any uh, statements with respect to recommendations. Um, that's my job in order to be able to do and not do that. Um, one thing that many geotechnical engineers who are relatively what I would consider risk adverse um, end up doing is you now significantly increase your risk for potential litigation. Um, if there is a problem on that project um, and you've recommended uh, directional drilling, um, directional drilling is not the right option or they have problems in it, um, now you've got the potential to be saying you, Mr. Geotechnical Expert, um, recommended using uh, directional drilling or this trenchless method with on that site. So as I said, um, I don't want that issue coming back if there is a problem later on. I'm going to tell any uh, geotechnical engineers in, in their reports to remove any of those things. Um, what I've seen is many of them are wrong and not correct um, and, um, and again shows negligence on their part making recommendations that are beyond the scope of what they've asked for. Um, I think that if you want to be uh, and make those site investigations report, then you need to be involved in the design practice. Um, make sure you establish yourself as an expert in the field. Um, you want to be part of that design team. Um, you don't want to be able to take a relatively small fee of a thousand or a couple thousand dollars and be involved in a multi-million dollar litigation project. We are talking about very large projects and assume if they go off the rails and there are issues on there, um, you can get yourself thrown in um, for um, relatively small fee. So again, it doesn't make very good business sense to, to do a $2,000 job and take on a multi-million dollar liability on that side. What I always recommend to the geotechnical engineers and community is that if you want um, and the owner wants some recommendations um, on that, then you do that as a separate report. Um, make sure that your geotechnical information is a factual report and then add this as a separate report on, on the other side. Um, that, um, and what I'm not uh, talking about is in, that, in the industry is uh, geotechnical baseline reports. They came out of the tunneling industry. Um, geotechnical baseline reports is another way of producing factual information for the contractors to bid information on. Unfortunately, um, these projects are usually too small than uh, large tunneling projects, and no one really wants to be able to do a factual or geotechnical baseline type report. Um, some common thoughts. I can just add any report or uh, report limitation statements to reduce my liability and the use of the report. Um, I see these all the time um, where the geotech community will put in a statement saying that no one else can use this report. It was only done for the uh, owner um, and no one else can use it without their permission. Um, you can put in any statement that you want in a tender package, such as the contractors responsible for geotechnical, getting their own geotechnical information or that they cannot rely on the report as part of their tender and they have to get their own information. I can tell you this as a fact, um, they will not stand up in court. Um, if the report is good enough for the engineer of record to complete the design, then why is it not good enough for the contractor to rely on? Um, so I've been involved in many projects where they've tried to use those statements. Um, as I say, you can put in anything 
you want in your tender package or your geotechnical report, um, but often they won't stand up in court or in, in litigation. Lesson number two, uh, do not count on statements in tenders or in your reports to limit your litigation exposure. Um, so that's one, many statements will not stand up in court or help you in litigation as you are a professional engineer and expect, expert in the field. Um, you are the expert, um, the contractor is not necessarily the expert. Um, I always tell contractors when I'm working for them and they're involved in a project, um, just pretend you're the dumb contractor. The contractors often have a lot more experience and knowledge than the engineers that are designing these projects, unfortunately. We, and that's something that I think we need to change in the, in the future. So what I want to be able to do is look at some real case studies that I've been involved in um, around transverse projects. So this one is a 1200 millimeter diameter reinforced concrete. Um, it was specified in the tender to be a Jack and Jabor sewer at 0.3% grade. So um, if you know anything, 0.03% grade is extremely flat. Uh, most sewers typically run around 1% grade. Um, very difficult even in open cut construction to get down half a percent. Um, this is an extremely flat uh, sewer grade. So um, very challenging project right from the get go. The reason they're going from 0.3% uh, grade is they don't want to put in a pumping station and, um, and have the operating and maintenance costs. So I think someone's dreaming or looking at uh, uh, doing something very, uh, very challenging um, just when you look at the, the scope. So it's uh, 66 meters long. Uh, relatively short between manhole 31 and manhole 32. Um, there's already an existing 1200 millimeter uh, um, um, gravity pipe here, and there's a 975 on the upside, and they're just going to make this connection between these two sections of pipe, so it seems relatively straightforward. Um, we're down three meters deep at manhole 32. We're almost six meters deep at manhole 30, uh, 31. So it's a um, relatively, think, relatively simple uh, project, um, but this grade is extremely. Now the question is, what does Jack and Bohr mean? Because that's what's been specified by the owner. Um, some of the design issues and construction issues with respect to, you got to sink the shafts from manhole 31 to manhole 32. Um, typically, I'm going to mine upgrade. Um, contractors are going to work upgrade because then that way they can control the grade. So contractors are going to start at manhole 32 and they're going to come up to manhole 31. And I think as any uh, good engineer, you need to be thinking like the contractor and understand how they're actually going to work. Um, the other reason you're going to mine upgrade is if there's any groundwater, it's going to flow downhill. If I go the other way, um, it's going to flow down and out of, out of my pit. If I go the other way, it's going to come at, it could be coming at towards me. Um, um, as I said, 0.3% is very low. Um, construction method will really depend on where the groundwater table is and how can I, and tunnel face stability. So um, 1,200 millimeters, I can actually go inside and do the work inside this pipeline. Um, if you look at what does jack and bore mean, um, there are a variety of different specifications. There is a specification, Ontario Provincial Standard Specification for jack and bore. Um, it tells you nothing about how the tunnel face is excavated and, and there's little information on this standard. Um, if you look at industry best practices, you look at the International Society of Trenchless Technologies, North American Associate, or North American uh, Society of Trenchless Technologies, American Society of Civil Engineers had a variety of different guidelines and publications. There's absolutely no definitions of jack and bore. Jack and bore seems I'm going to jack as I bore or do uh, tells me nothing about the construction methodology. And there's a variety of different methods that actually fit in. Um, what does it mean? Does it mean tunnel boring, uh, micro tunneling, a small boring unit? A hand auger boring or basically hand mining. These are all can be considered um, depending on the construction methodology fit the term of jack and bore. Um, micro tunneling is going to be um, three to four times more than auger boring for the same construction project. So again, this is a catch-all um, term that doesn't really mean anything. 
Um, I actually was involved in a litigation case uh, a little over a year ago where the contractor or the owner had specified Jack and Boar and the geotechnical consultants that were the uh, expert on the other side um, also kept on using the term Jack and Boar. And um, anyways, it was, I had a lot of fun because I really don't, anybody asked me what Jack and Boar means, I said, I really don't know. Um, I, I get confused quite easily. Um, lesson number three, be careful what you specify and make sure it's an industry standard and defined term. Um, be able to cite the definition with respect to a standard or some, some organization so that you actually uh, mean, um, so as I say in the bottom, Jack and Boar is similar to specifying a car. I, I want a car, it doesn't tell me anything. What kind of performance do I do, want? Um, there's many different types of cars. There's many different types of construction methodology. All of these will have a huge impact on the cost um, as well as, and uh, on that side. Now, the engineer of record had to do a cost estimate for the project. So if their cost estimate is somewhere around $250,000 um, for the, the project, there's no way they actually mean microtunneling. Um, so you can get back to... Uh, what um, the engineer had specified and and um, saying that what this actually means instead of being vague um, as in this case. All right, so we've got this project. The question would be how many boreholes and where would, and uh, where would you put them? And the next question, if I'm going to do uh, request geotechnical information, how deep do I want to go? So I've got a variety of different choices of locations. I'm going to drill ideally in the manhole locations because I'm going to be excavating in that in those places and I got to sink my shaft. So I'm going to be doing a full excavation. So let's get that information. I need to go below the invert of the existing pipe. Um, so in an ideal world, I would have at least uh, two boreholes in each manhole location. So manhole 31 and manhole 32 and another one hopefully in the middle around there. So I need to be able to know where the groundwater table is and can I dewater this site or, or not. Now the next question you have to ask yourself is where along do I do the, to do the boreholes? Um, manhole 31 and 32 are going to be excavated so I can do those exactly where they are. Um, borehole number three, the one that's going to be in the middle, should I do it on the center line or should I do it offline? In a traditional open cut project, um, doesn't matter where you do them, and I would do them, on, they're typically done online. If I'm doing a trenchless type project, I'm going to do them offline. The last thing I want is a tunnel boring machine or a directional drill going into an area where there was a previous borehole that could possibly change the ground conditions or cause a place for my fluids to frack out. Um, so you also have to look at good practices, and good practices basically states that you do them offline. So ASTM F19, sec. Uh, 62 for directional drilling says do them offline. ASC uh, microtunneling guide also states to do them at a sufficient lateral distance to either side from proposed uh, bore path to avoid boring into the test holes. And again, we don't want to have equipment failure in the location of a borehole. Um, that means it's not necessarily the contractor's fault. We've created a potential place for leakage uh, or something to happen. So again, um, goes back to my statement before, know what good practices are in the industry and what the guidelines are. Um, so we're typically going to do boreholes offline um, during the construction. So the uh, consultants did a geotechnical site investigation for this project. So let's see what they've done. They've done three boreholes. They went nice and deep on this location. So in, in this case, again, 66 meters, three boreholes. I've got lots of geotechnical information. Um, ideally. So basically uh, what the geotech boreholes say, I've got uh, sand and gravel um, in this unit, um, an upper sand and gravel, and I've got a sand and silt that's down here. And my groundwater table is uh, somewhere is going to be in the middle of the, around the inside the pipeline. Um, so in order to be able to excavate this, I'm going to have to dewater this site because this is high groundwater table. So I've got to lower my groundwater table down to here. Um, the other thing that to note is there's a clay till, so this is basically an impermeable boundary. Um, it's well below the invert of the pipe, so I should be able to dewater basically to this uh, interface level or close to it. 
um, except for uh, at uh, manhole 31. I'm going to be very close to this tilt boundary and the other ones, but I'm mind. And in this location in the middle, I should have mixed face conditions. I should have sand and gravel on the top and uh, silt, uh, sand and silt on the bottom. Um, predominantly a little bit of sand and silt at the top and uh, silt on the bottom. So I got a pretty good idea what the ground conditions and this stuff should be. Um, very doable, provided I put in some well points. I should be able to dewater the sand and silts and these gravels relatively easy in order to be able to construct in the dry. So as I said, main tunnel face will be man mainly in sand with a little bit of mixed face conditions. Dewatering should be easy. Um, blow counts for the soils show that uh, they're relatively high, so the face should be stable. Um, pipe diameter is large enough, and uh, in this case, um, we're going to use um, a person in the front to be able to do the excavation. And, and again, that's uh, kind of a jack and bore, um, but we're really talking about hand mining. It's probably the cheapest solution in this case, and it should be able to work. Somebody should be able to work. So this is starting at manhole 32, and they're just advanced on the inside of the front of the face. You can see the large diameter uh, concrete pipe that's being pushed in as they excavate at the front of the face. So that's, um, that's jacking and boring. Um, this is a piece that was brought out from the front of the face, and if you look at it, um, that's a piece of a tree. Um, that was not in a, any of the sand and gravel or anything, so they were um, excavating pieces of tree. Um, there's a more, more pieces of tree that were excavated uh, out of the tunnel face. And now you're starting to look, there's a contractor that's now excavating or mining through the forest. These are all tree pieces. Um, in order to be able to excavate these things out, uh, they are using an electric chainsaw. Um, the contractor did not bid this job um, to uh, remove pieces of tree from this area. So how, and I mean, how can you produce a borehole in this location and miss the trees? And there was actually all kinds of trees and re remnants and this stuff. So. Um, this, this area was a fill that was uh, placed back in, um, so the contractor had to do this. So they uh, did get placed, uh, paid extra in order to be able to do um, this mining through the things, but they're going to be bringing extra material and the stuff out of the front. It's going to be very hard to control the alignment. Um, they had to build a tunnel shield uh, above the face in order to be able for this worker to be able to work on this side. Um, they're doing the welding on the inside. Um, guess what? They had all kinds. This is a 0.3% grade sewer. They're going to have a, uh, alignment issues and construction issues around here. So more trees to be removed. Okay, so they finally got out of the trees, which was in this section for the first third. Um, then they get into this borehole here. Um, this is borehole um, number three. So there's the borehole. So they did it on mine. Um, it was an interesting meeting when we were talking with meeting with the owner. Um, contractor said boreholes can change and very, very quickly. Um, this is till on the bottom. Um, this is the silty sand on the top. So you can see in the middle of this, the tunnel, the till face is uh, two thirds of the way through the face. Um, there are waters coming down in through this face in order to be able to, to be able to leave it. Um, the tunnel, the till contact was supposed to be down here, well below the in face. Um, now they uh, now they got a water problem with respect to mud face conditions. So again, ground conditions are nothing like what they were um, in the geotechnical investigation. Some of the construction issues associated with um, this project was uh, Tunnel grade and alignment issues, 0.3% uh, grade. When you say 0.3, what do you mean? Do you need to pass a ball test from one end to the other? Um, is it 0.3% all the way from point A to point B? Um, the extremely slow progress contractor had a over uh, $250,000 claim. So this project basically doubled in cost. Um, even though we had uh, mainly due to changing ground conditions, even though we got lots of geotech, um, in this case, I don't know what happened, but the geotech was not represented over the actual site conditions. Um, lesson number four, uh, changing ground condition often results in higher cost than the contractor's bid. Um, Professor uh, Ralph Beck went, uh, gave a cross Canada uh, lecture for the Canadian Geotechnical Society 
um, quite a few, a few years ago, and his title of his talk was Expect the Unexpected. So uh, as he said, always expect the anything. Um, no geotech is better than poor geotech in this case. Um, when things go wrong, get it fixed without litigation. Um, contractor just wants to get paid. He doesn't really want to get litigation. Um, in this in this project, the consulting engineers um, that were in charge of the project would not approve and the stuff, and it almost went to litigation until the owner started to realize that um, it was not the contractor's uh, fault um, with respect to the construction delays and the stuff. So eventually, the truth will come out um, around it. So again, um, let's reduce that one. Um, all right, so this second one is a force main um, that's going to be constructed um, just outside of uh, Kawartha Lakes. Um, this is the Screwdog River that comes down to, into the city of Kawartha Lakes. Um, this, they want to develop this area, and there's a wastewater. This is actually a pumping station over here, and they want to build a uh, force main that's going to go from this point to here to get the uh, sewage to this pumping station so they can pump it to the treatment plant. Um, the river has P PCBs in it. Um, this used to be a train train bridge, um, but uh, they and there's an abandoned landfill in here um, with uh, lots of nasty contaminants and the stuff in it. And there's some PCBs in the river, um, as I say. So uh, there's PCBs in the river. Um, the sediment is not allowed to be disturbed, so we can't do open cut. So they're going to want to go trenchless in this project. Um, I got involved uh, for the city of Kawartha Lakes. They retained me to review the uh, consultants' uh, recommendations. Um, the consultants had done uh, three boreholes, a um, borehole here, a borehole here, and a borehole here. Um, they didn't want to drill in the river. Um, because of these contaminated sediments and PCBs. So they did some river soundings. Um, basically, they said there's nine meters of river sediment. Um, here's the bottom of the river, and bedrock is going to be down here, and that the bedrock is basically a limestone bedrock and with respect to it. So again, relatively shallow boreholes, um, not much information on uh, the quality of the rock especially in, in these areas. And this borehole is really is almost outside the area of, ex, of, of interest. Um, the consultants that were retained um, proposed a directional drill install. Um, and they were going to put two 500 millimeter force mains. They're going to directional drill along this distance. Um, and they're going to go down and they wanted to be two meters below the uh, bedrock. Um, so we're looking at somewhere around 18 meters deep in this install here as a as a as a design. The other one was a jack and bore tunnel. That's what they called it. Um, and it's 1.2 meter diameter steel tunnel that they were going to put in and they're going to put the force main um, down in through here and bring it back up uh, out afterwards. Um, we're down about 18 meters deep, so um, this is on the landfill side, so I have to sink a shaft of uh, 18 meters deep uh, next to a landfill. I've got another 18 meter deep shaft that I have to drill or dig over here um, in order to be able to do this. Um, when I reviewed this information, and there's my borehole log records, um, I'm working way below the geotechnical information and the stuff. My first recommendation was to do some two boreholes in the middle, get a barge, come out, um, do them offline, um, do them on a barge, and then grow these things afterwards um, to make sure that we have no pathways um, for the material. Um, the owner agreed with this recommendation, so they went out and we um, they did two more boreholes. Um, the engineer of record uh, estimated the cost around three million. Um, they determined that uh, micro jack and bore, or basically micro tunneling, was probably going to be one of the cheapest option in this case, and because there was low risk of disturbing the sediments. So um, my assessment on geotech and geotech risk is we don't have enough geotech to be able to actually know what we're going to get in. We have no idea the risk of this tunneling if this is going to be fractured rock at the top. And the water's going to come in. What happens if this water contains P PCBs? If there's a contractor working in the front of this face and PCBs are coming in, 
Um, that's going to be a major risk and a major uh, slowdown on this project. How do you, what do you do? The other risk associated with the project is digging the this shaft over here and again dealing with possibly contaminated groundwater um, and soil um, because of the landfill over here. Um, they, that wasn't accounted for in their uh, $3 million cost. So when I looked at this project, I said it's more than a $3 million project um, if you're going to use that one. So, um, as I said, I recommended uh, two more boreholes, at least two meters off the tunnel line. Uh, go below the tunnel by at least three meters to confirm bedrock and the quality. Um, they did put a barge out. Uh, they did um, they did the, the boreholes on the tunnel alignment, and they also did not grout the line. So, again, there was a misin misinformation. Even though we clearly articulated not to do them, they did them on the alignment and they weren't grouted. So they now created a potential pathway uh, for construction issues, as well as a potential pathway for PCBs, as well as a potential pathway for drill fluids to come out to the surface. After we did the, um, the actual boreholes, we um, found out that uh, bedrock was, there was not nine meters of sediment, there was only one meter of sediment. So the bedrock profile actually looked like this. Um, it lined up much better with the uh, existing profiles before we were way down in here in this zone. Um, the good news is now we can move up the construction into this one, and we found out that the first meter was pretty fractured red bedrock limestone, but once we get down below one meter, we're into um, very good uh, um, um, non-fractured and, and stable bedrock. Again, this is the actual profile versus what they were proposing be before, um, not even the same site conditions. So uh, again, we can make all kinds of different issues and the stuff around it. So again, uh, boreholes, we now know that we've got RQDs of 25, we've got recoveries and, and it increases to 60%. So again, uh, we can understand. So then I could do a uh, directional drilling design um, it's 290 meters long. I'm going to be down six meters below here and so I don't frack out. I got my entrance angles of around eight degrees, my pipe exit angle around nine degrees, which is around good practice guidelines. Um, it, there was a worry of a frack out. Um, oops. Worries about uh, fracking out and uh, drill floats coming up and disturbing these sediments. Um, we could easily come up with a contingency plan where the contractor could install a casing. Um, and if, uh, if we ended up having high pore pressures or we started to see any drill fluids migrating, and in that case, we would just pump down those drill fluids so that we could maintain them below the level of here um, only if we needed to. So we could build this into the contingency plan that the contractor is prepared for on, uh, on the design side. Um, was not needed. Um, the review of the consultant's HDD design, it was not constructible, it was an AutoCAD drawing, it was never done in a proper design tool such as uh, Borate, which is a tool that we created. Um, I got a cost estimate around 1.5 million, which is half the cost of the Jack and Bore 3 million. Um, we can put in a frack out plan in place in order to mitigate risk. So again, we're doing good engineering. Um, HDD is very doable in the rock to lower the risk than, than uh, jack and bore. Um, one thing the owner never did uh, or the consulting engineer never did was a proper risk assessment um, you know, on behalf of the owner to, to look at the different projects. So what construction method was used? Um, HDD or Jack and Bore, well, they actually went with microtunneling. Um, the total cost was around $5 million. They had all kinds of construction issues around there, um, and it could have easily been done uh, for less than uh, $1.5 million, um, and then um, well less than $5 million for sure if we used directional drilling. So in this case, the owner way overpaid for a project um, just because of bad engineering. But, um, that was very doable, but um, with getting proper geotech. Um, lesson number five, um, not all engineers are expert in trenchless technologies. Uh, make sure you practice within your area of expertise so you, the, so you can't be defined or termed negligent. 
Um, as I said, you wouldn't wanna have brain surgery done by a foot doctor. Um, there's no substitute for boreholes, even in hard to access locations. Um, if you need to get a barge, get a barge, go out and get that stuff done. Huge cost savings in this case was uh, could have been realized by getting that extra borehole information, bringing that up uh, a long ways um, and lowering the contractor's risk. Um, another case study, in this case, um, it's a 600 millimeter uh, high density polyethylene sewer. Um, now we're at 0.8. Uh, percent grade and then it was changed to 0.87 so 0.9 so um, we're close to the one uh, one percent which is uh, doable um, it's about 300 meters of uh, pipe to be installed and it's going to be it's specified as directional drilling so we're going to start down here and come back up and end out here so here's um, the borehole data and the stuff that was actually done by the uh, consulting engineers um, prior to construction, they've got a 0.8% a grade sewer. Um, they've got three, two boreholes, so we've got lots of geotechnical borehole information and the stuff that was there. Um, basically, the boreholes were going were gonna to be in uh, uh, till. Um, hard, silty soils, uh, sandy silt till um, was predominantly the type. Um, it was going to be relatively hard, slow uh, unraveling, so it, it, it was good material to be uh, directional drilled. So, is this HD owner specified design constructible? The answer is yes. We've got the 0.8 to 0.87, um, it, that again for directional drilling will be difficult. Again, it comes down to making sure how you specify. Um, polyethylene pipe will float inside the drill fluid, so it will rise up in top of the borehole. Um, again, um, we can still pass the ball test, but there may be sections that uh, have some undulations in it, um, but sewage will flow. Um, there are some occasional cobbles in the in the glacier, in the till uh, deposits that are round. Um, ground is very dense to bore and will stay open. Um, HDD has been done in the area by contractors, and it is basically the low cost option for this relatively deep install um, on the project. So the clip the bid was out to the contractor, and the contractor started. Um, during the construction, there were some issues uh, that that. They have hitting boulders during the pilot bar. Um, they did complete the pre-ream uh, successfully, but when they started to install the pipe, it, um, it got, um, the drill rods broke and the pipe got stuck in the ground and it was uh, they could not be removed even with a ramming tool. Um, the contractor started claiming uh, changing ground conditions. Um, the owner ended up, instead of doing more boreholes, ended up doing uh, sonic drill holes at a cost of around $23,000. So they were trying to prove that the contractor was basically wrong by doing these uh, sonic drill holes. So just to give you an idea, the pipe entry uh, came into the ground here. Um, reamer had failed here. The rods had failed here when the pipe was stuck in the ground on the, on the pilot bar. Um, so they ended up uh, doing this, uh, doing a second attempt. The, the first attempt, the everything failed in here, and the second time, uh, on the second attempt, it, it failed here. So, I was out to we called out to the site after the second attempt um, when the reamer failed, and so we dug an excavation to retrieve the reamer. Um, this was the reamer when it went into the ground. Um, it is suitable for drilling in till, um, and it's got all kinds of teeth in the stuff. And this is the reamer, that same reamer, 30 meters into the ground. What happened to all the teeth? So if let's go back, let's look at it. There's what it was when it went into the ground. Um, this is the reamer uh, 30 meters later. So this was a brand new reamer. It's got holes. All the teeth have been ripped off. Um, this is not normal ground conditions for the reamer um, for this thing. So this is not uh, boulders and cobbles and just till. So we dug down. Um, we basically found uh, sands and gravels 
Um, this was a, would make a beautiful gravel pit. So these were outwash deposits um, that was not till. Um, this was like drilling, trying to drill in a, uh, in a gravel pit. Um, wouldn't hold any water and it was basically dry. Um, I went back and I looked at the Ontario's official geology maps for the local area, um, which are free. Um, this is a Google Earth uh, download and you can zoom in and see what the area is. Um, unfortunately, uh, no geotech reports that I see um, use this information and is not in the geotech report, um, even though good practices state that it should be. So this is the geological or superficial geology for the local area. Um, this is where the drill head uh, was, the drill was proposed. On um, the top of it is uh, till, which is all this layer. Um, down in and this red line is a fluvial terrace. And there's another fluvial terrace over here. And you can start to see that uh, where the reamer got stuck was in this fluvial terrace. So what happened? The glaciers started to melt. This was an outwash channel. Um, these are high river, high energy deposits that are actually mapped on the mark. And this is exactly where the drill head got uh, tore up by uh, drilling into those sands and gravels. Um, Directional drilling is not the be-all and end-all tool. Um, we have to have the right equipment for the right soil conditions. In this case, um, there was information to say if I drilled my boreholes in this till, I would see till. Um, a little bit of extra information would have realized that that information, which they ended up finding in the field, was already available in this case, which was sands and gravels. Um, so it was a clear case that the contractor was not uh, making up the ground conditions. Um, they did have a legitimate claim for changing ground conditions. Um, this information was not provided at the time of tender um, and they were not found when the sonic drilling um, that they did and they spent another $23,000 on that case. It wasn't occasional boulders. Lesson number six, ge geotechnical community needs to use available public published quaternary and borehole data. Um, there's lots of borehole data also available in, um, in this uh, um, from the Ontario Geological Society. Um, this will help uh, provide you with information of where you need to do boreholes and how complicated the site conditions could possibly be at the site. Um, and currently, uh, based on my experience, uh, geotechnic community in our local area is not using uh, best industry practices and standards. Lesson number seven, um, there's many people involved in a project. There's the owner, the engineer of record, which is the designer. Um, the geotechnical engineer is also uh, retained by the designer, the project en engineer, and the contractor and, uh, and their potential subcontractor. Um, typically, litigation starts to happen when uh, some people here um, think they know it all, um, when the engineer will not listen to the contractor or the and the project site engineer. So when there's polarization that happens between these different groups, and I've seen it in person, I've seen uh, the um, quality assurance, quality control uh, person in the field uh, know it all. Um, the contractor didn't know anything, but this uh, technician did, um, and they ended up creating a litigation case that lasted for three or four years. Um, litigation potential increases when polarization occurs between uh, any of these parties in place. Um, we're all there to make this a win. Um, contractors are going to get paid, uh, especially if, if there's certain uh, um, litigation issues around uh, changing ground conditions. Their, their, their chances of winning a change in ground conditions is extremely high, so best work together to get things resolved. Um, Get is lesson number eight, get issues resolved as soon as possible. Um, the bigger the project um, and the bigger the claim, um, the longer the contractor's been shut down on a project, um, the bigger the claim is going to get um, and it's not going to go away. The contractor has to recover those costs when they get big enough to get the lawyers involved um, and the lawyers are going to drag it out and continue to, uh, it's going to take several years to get resolved. Best if you can think. Uh, don't think you know it all. Um, contractors often know more than many of the engineers. They're doing these projects every day, um, and they just want to get it done so they can get on to the next job. Um, 
No one wants litigation except for lawyers. Lesson number nine, litigation brings out issues on site and takes seven years, several years to get resolved. Um, lawyers will always tell you at the beginning of any case that you've always got a good case. Um, they get paid by the hour, so they, they don't want it necessarily to go away. Um, it's not until you get down through uh, a year or two um, that they'll actually tell you what your chances are of winning your case um, and, and that side. And it gets very expensive to be able to go to court. Another thing that I've learned that many of the experts are not always experts. Um, I've been involved in many litigation cases where the experts on the other side um, didn't necessarily know how to do the design. Uh, maybe they were geotechnical experts, but they didn't understand uh, trenchless construction or the, or the construction methodologies, and they were acting uh, often beyond their level of expertise. So again, um, there's the technical side um, on that side. And technical issues are often only a small part uh, as the case um, begins to progress. I've seen uh, many cases where the contractor had great uh, reasons and technical issues in order to be able to do it, um, but because of the time and the length of litigation or possibly the uh, quality of uh, staff and notes that they had, um, they didn't want to pursue it and they basically settled uh, prior to. So a lot of these things will end up in, in settlement in a period of time. My last lesson, number 10, is do more and better geotechnical investigations, even for small projects. Um, there's huge cost savings to the owners to be done. Um, do not put uh, design recommendations in the site investigation report. If the uh, engineers want it, uh, be careful. Uh, be part of the whole design team and design process. Uh, put it in a separate, a separate report. Um, make sure you know all the facts um, on that side. Um, I'm going to quote uh, Ralph Peck again, expect the unexpected for site conditions. I think I've, I've showed you that uh, in a couple of the case studies that I've been involved in. Uh, make sure you use all available information to supplement your existing boreholes um, and your borehole data. Uh, make sure you are an, ex an, an expert by attending trenchless workshops and conferences. Um, many of these engineers that are designing and specifying these projects as the engineer of record um, haven't been involved in, in uh, workshops, uh, training courses. There's a wide variety of them that are offered worldwide. Um, we do them um, many uh, through our center um, at CAT. Um, there's no excuses why um, you wouldn't want to be the on, on, um, on the stand with a lawyer asking if you attended and did you attend this course? Did you do this one? Did you go to the no dig conference? Etc. You know, so we need to uh, increase our training level on that side. Uh, trenchless projects are very different than other infrastructure projects. Um, another new resource that is now available, we in August just released uh, CAT UniTrack. Um, this is a uh, e-learning that's available 24/7. Uh, it's a very cost-effective way to establish yourself as an expert, an industry expert, and and have access to extremely valuable information or to help train uh, other people. Um, there are modules, there's training modules, there's virtual construction sites, and there's technical resources and books and stuff that are available. Um, just amazing graphics. The, we partnered with a group out of Germany that created these uh, amazing animations to be able to show you how um, these construction technologies and methodologies actually work. Um, and we brought it in and, and adapted it for the North American market. Um, there's 16 modules uh, already available. Um, there's more that we're putting in place uh, before Christmas. And then we're going to, the next thing we'll have is uh, after Christmas is the first e-learning module where you can learn at your own pace um, and, uh, and do training. I'm a huge opponent for uh, lifelong learning. Um, I learn something every day. I learn a lot getting involved in litigation cases and doing research and um, talking to students. Um, so I engage you to uh, adopt that lifelong learning uh, process. Um, we need to learn and continue to learn to be better engineers. Um, I'm a lot better, I think, engineer now than I was uh, 15 years ago. Um, that's because of the learning process. 
I encourage you to uh, become a teacher and a mentor um, as, as you progress through your career. Um, it's a great and a wonderful learning experience. I think I've learned more by trying to explain concepts to other people than I did by being in, in, uh, in class and, and variety of different components and the stuff. So um, I'm going to close out there, and I will hope I will leave it to, uh, and hopefully try to answer any questions that you have. Awesome! Thank you so much, Mark. That was that was really great. We're just going to look into the questions now. Okay, so the first question that I see in the YouTube chat is, are there any excavation methods that you see result in more litigations than other excavation methods? Um, no. The answer is, is no. I've, I've been involved in litigation from uh, very simple technologies where we were using auger boring to put a culvert underneath a highway. Um, again, that all kinds of construction issues. In this case, in one case, uh, sinkholes happened in the highway um, during construction. Um, they blamed the contractor for it. And again, it was a design issue. In this case, um, they didn't have enough soil cover. Um, so, and I've also been involved in, in, in microtunneling and other projects where um, they were much bigger. So from the small side to the big side, um, again, it all comes down to cost. Um, how big is the extra claim? If it's twice or three times, how much is someone willing to litigate? I'm involved in a litigation case for a municipality where they're actually suing the engineer um, firm that completed the design because there was an extra $750,000 cost on a project that should have been done around two hundred fifty dollars or 300000 So again, um, um, there's, a variety, there's a variety. So I wouldn't say there's one more than, than the other. It's really uh, putting out bad designs that weren't really constructible. Mm, okay. Okay. Um, I see another question as well, referring to young engineers specifically. So it says that as a young engineer in the field, what kinds of obstacles should we be looking for or what kind of observations are useful to take note of when you're drilling for a trenchless investigation? Okay, so again, it comes back to the methodology and the pipe size. Um, one thing that um, if I uh, typically we're looking at uh, a meter and above for person entry to be able to go inside the pipeline. So if we're smaller than a person entry and we're using and specifying a technique um, and we've got boulders and cobbles, um, then how big are those boulders and how big are those cobbles in order to be able to get yourself um, and to be able to remove them. So if they stop the equipment, um, um, then we, we have an issue. The other thing that I need to know is the type of boulders and cobbles and the stuff that I'm going to have. Um, in southern Ontario, we have uh, a till. Um, those tills were formed by glaciers that moved down um, from the north. Um, bedrock in the southern Ontario area is basically shales and, and, and limestones, um, but we can get um, a large granitic um, boulders that are that are basically in the till. So then again, we we just need to be able to risk and understand from a design perspective those issues. Um, so sometimes we can start with a smaller casing. We've run into problems with a telescope, or we'll go larger in order to be able to be able to remove boulders and cobbles. So in, even though I may have a small diameter pipe, I will specify a larger diameter construction technique. Um, and then install my pipeline inside that larger diameter just to be able to remove the boulders and cobbles. Again, from a tunneling, on the tunneling industry side, um, again, boulders and cobbles um, or wear of teeth on the front can, can matter. Um, so if I, again, specify a small uh, diameter piece of equipment um, and, uh, and something happens to my cutting head, um, do I have access to the face or not? If 
pipe don't have access to the face, the machine gets stuck, um, then, um, then I don't have many options. So again, it's kind of doing that risk assessment. So sometimes you may want to make the, uh, a larger diameter pipe um, and, and install a casing and then install your product pipe afterwards just to mitigate those risks. So again, it's understanding what those risks are. Okay. I've got a quick question. Um, in combination with Madison's question about uh, relationships between excavation methods and litigation, have you seen a contrast in number of litigations based on their procurement route? And uh, as a supplement to that, how many of these uh, trenchless construction projects are actually procured under a framework or an alliance model? So almost all the projects in that are municipal projects are the first model that I showed you, which is the um, a typically owner design um, and contractor build. So in this case, the owner is going to design it or their engineer and the contractor is only building what they've been told to build. So that, that is majority. Um, then they have to do low bid. Um, they have to take the low bid. Um, some, contra um, some owners will pre-qualify contractors if they get into relatively uh, tough, um, if they know that there's certain projects where they don't want somebody learning and bringing a low price to them to, to the bid that they want to eliminate, so they may pre-qualify bidders. It's very hard to get around that. Um, I've been involved in projects where we have tight construction timelines um, where I've gone to the other model where you move the risk to the contractor by doing a contractor design build. Um, in that case, you get a much faster project, um, but you still need to do the geotech investigation and the stuff on that side. So predominantly, um, they're typically owner designed on that. But when you say, when you mention transferring the risk to the contractor, I'm assuming the client's still taking the ground risk. Yes, you provide uh, geotechnical information to the contractor. Um, in that case, they pr propose their own route. Um, they pr and they take the geotechnical information that you will have and they use that as guidance to prepare their bid. And, and their design, and in that case, they're, provo they're proposing the methodology, the techniques and the equipment that they want to use. Um, they are also stamping the engineering design um, and providing you, um, so, but I need to specify exactly what I want, performance specification. Mm -hmm. Of course. And in that case, if they need to get more geotech in order to mitigate their risk, then they're responsible for it. We've got another question. Caitlin, do you want to pick that up? Yeah, for sure. So this other question says that as a beginner in the um, HDD design, what resources are recommended to read and look for so that um, someone can be more knowledgeable? Ah, good question. Um, the North American Society of Transless Technology produces a good practice guideline. Um, it's a book that's available. Um, that and so that is uh, one way um, in order to be able to do it. Um, there's a variety of different standards and methodologies. Um, ASTM F1962 is a standard for the design of the pipeline. Um, so that is, and it's also noted and provided in detail in the plastic pipe handbook on that tool. Um, we've created, uh, I've created a, a free online web tool with the Plastic Pipe Institute. It's called PPI Borate. So www.ppiboreaid.com. If you go to that website, you'll be able to uh, click on and see how a pipe design is actually done on that side. Um, I would also suggest um, NESTT, as well as CAT, um, provides a specific uh, design course on direction, on horizontal directional drilling. Um, I just did one a, a, a week ago, um, and um, so those are available. So those resources and the stuff. When you get into real design, I would recommend a program that we created. It's called Borate, which is a full design program. 
It's now sold by Vermeer. So it's called Vermeer Borate. And there's lots of uh, resources and information in that in order to be able to show you how to do a, a proper design. Awesome. Okay, thank you so much for the resources. That's great. Um, and then I see one more question as well. So what investigation method do you suggest for having good base information for calculating BVR, boulder volume ratio, in trenchless tunneling? And does PQ coring help? That's a good question. Um, I've seen test pits being dug, if you're really worried about it. Um, my, the way I look at any project is I look at the superficial geology. I go back to those superficial geology and I, and I try to understand um, the formation and how soils were formed in the local area that, you're, that we're working in. Um, so in that case, I know that if they're till, um, that there's a, always will be occasional cobbles and boulders. Um, if the ground has high enough blow counts, um, I know that I can I can typically um, remove and and they're not going to be an issue on that side. Um, most time, if I run into occasional boulder, that may be a risk that I'm willing to try um, and to see. Uh, sometimes we just we get unlucky. The issue that really causes a problem are uh, that are showstoppers for especially directional drilling. Wood, uh, wood will bind up the the reamer in the bit and and not allow you to progress. Uh, the other one is nested boulders and cobbles. So if we get into as I showed you in that case study where we got the fluvial high energy sands and boulders and cobbles and they're all nested together um, and that forms a very uh, like a, a gravel pit um, of boulders and cobbles or former uh, high energy beach type environment um, then I'm going to start to get a little bit worried and and that stuff so again um, I'm going to choose my bore path as designer to get into stable and good ground conditions I don't want a lot of different changing ground conditions. I want to move my, I don't want uh, mixed face conditions. Again, I will not put a bore path at the interface between bedrock and ground conditions because that changes. Again, um, that's part of the idea of sometimes I can go deeper and uh, deeper down into solid bedrock or into uh, better ground conditions. Um, and 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 get out of um, those nested boulders and cobbles. So I'm looking for showstoppers, but I'm basing that on having a good geological model of how the soils were formed in that local area, and is there any fill or any other debris or something else that was brought in that's going to cause me problems as well. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Divik, do you have any other questions? Uh, none from my side, and I think being mindful of the time, uh, we should perhaps bring the Q&A to a close. So I'll take the opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Knight um, from BTSYM's behalf for sharing his valuable knowledge with us. And certainly through the presentation, throughout the presentation, we find, found out that there are common grounds between the market in UK and Canada, but quite as well outside both of our countries, um, where uh, Dr. Knight's um, experience can be used um, and the lessons he has shared can actually lead to improvement within the market. So thanks a lot once again, um, Dr. Knight, for your presentation. My pleasure. And thank you for your patience and staying with me. I know I was a little bit long, but. Absolutely fine. It was quite enjoyable. And if anybody has any questions at any time, feel free to reach out to me. Thanks for that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Knight. On, on behalf of TAC Young members, too, that was really informative and, and awesome. And I feel like it's a good refresher on, on doing good site investigation as well. Like that really, the presentation really reaffirms the importance of that. And thank you. I thought that was that was wonderful. And just on behalf of, of TAC Young members as well, we do have another talk coming up on October 29th at 3 p.m. 
Um, and that one is going to be put on by Tamara Kondrachova, and it's on cost analysis on the Greater Toronto Area Tunneling Project. So you can follow our tax social media for updates. So um, yeah, and so that's a, a thank you from TAC Young members as well. That was awesome. My pleasure.